On the afternoon of March 14, 1968, three boys were playing in a muddy farm field near the corner of Newland Street and Yorktown Avenue in Huntington Beach, California, when they made a horrific discovery. They stumbled upon the body of a young woman who had been severely beaten and had her throat slashed. Her autopsy would show that she had also been sexually assaulted. Police combed through the field and located a cigarette butt and tire tracks near the body. However, it had rained the previous night, making it difficult to say with certainty what type of tire had left the tracks. The location of the tracks indicated that the woman's body may have been dumped out of the passenger side of a vehicle. Police had few leads to follow to identify the woman's killer, but also had few direct clues to identify the woman. She had no identification with her, and a missing persons report consistent with her appearance did not come in during the following days. The woman was white or Hispanic, approximately 5 feet 1 inch tall, and between 20 and 30 years old. No drugs or alcohol were found in her system. She was wearing a floral shirt, purple pants, a black jacket, and a ring with a blue stone. Her black shoes were one of the best leads investigators had, as that brand of shoe was only sold in New York at the time. Authorities theorized that their Jane Doe may have been someone from the East Coast who hitchhiked to California. She had potentially then been killed by someone she accepted a ride from. Despite following up on several leads, police could still not identify their victim, which in turn limited their avenues of investigation into her murder, as they could not investigate any of her known acquaintances or identify any motives to want to harm her. Decades passed with the woman remaining unidentified and her killer remaining unpunished. One of the boys who had found her grew up, joined the Huntington Beach Police Department, and retired, with the woman remaining unidentified that entire time. Eventually, the case became Orange County's oldest unsolved Jane Doe case. Authorities did not give up on identifying the woman and her killer, however, and as technology improved over the ensuing decades, they used it to generate new leads. Her fingerprints were entered into state and federal databases, and in 2011, her partial DNA profile was developed from blood on her blouse and entered into the combined DNA index system. In 2016, images of her body, as well as pictures of her ring and shoes, were released to the public in a renewed effort to locate someone who could identify her. In 2001, her clothes and rape kit had been processed, and a male DNA sample was identified. There was no match to it in any criminal database, however. The cigarette butt found near the body was examined in hopes of finding DNA in 2010. A male DNA profile, consistent with the one identified in 2001 from the rape kit in clothes, was developed from it, but authorities still could not identify the man whose DNA it was. In 2010, homicide detective Pat Ellis began working on the case with his partner, Mark Riley. He remained working on the case until his retirement in January 2020. Jane Doe's body had been exhumed in 2019 but testing was unable to provide a full DNA sample. She was buried in an unmarked grave in Newport Beach, rather than in a potter's grave, in hopes that technology would one day advance even more, and it would be easier to exhume her again for further testing. One of the last things Detective Ellis did before retiring was order new testing of Jane Doe's clothes. This retesting did finally result in a complete DNA profile of Jane Doe. Now that they had a complete DNA profile, investigators turned to genetic genealogy as a potential means of finally identifying Jane Doe. In July of 2020, 52 years after the murder, authorities announced that by using genetic genealogy, they had identified both their Jane Doe and her presumed killer. Jane Doe was Anita Louise Pateau, who had been 26 at the time of her death. One of seven children, she had moved to California from Maine in 1967 because of a fascination with the film industry. She remained in contact with her family through letters, which had abruptly stopped coming after February of 1968. Her family was concerned about the sudden lack of communication from Anita, but one of her final letters stated that she would be coming back to Maine that May. When May came and went without her returning home, they truly began to worry. Her parents and siblings did not have the means to travel to California, but they remained in contact with authorities in the state trying to find Anita. By 1980, Anita's niece, Lori Kirion, 
had also become involved in the search. She maintained regular contact with police in Whittier, California, where Anita had been renting a room and had posted her final letter and the Social Security Administration in hopes of finding her. Anita's parents, as well as three of her siblings, passed away before she was identified, but her surviving two sisters and brother were relieved to finally know what became of Anita. The man whose DNA was found at the scene was also identified as Johnny Crisco. Crisco could not be arrested for the crime because he had passed away in 2015. He died of throat cancer at the age of 71 in Washington State. Crisco's criminal history began when he was just 17. He had then joined the army and become a paratrooper. He was discharged from the army after three years when he failed a psychological examination. During the exam, he was diagnosed with positive aggressive reaction, or having a pattern of being quick to anger, easy to feel unjustly treated, chronically resentful, immature, and impulsive, according to investigators. Crisco was arrested in 1971, but his record was subsequently purged. He married three times and had two children. Both of his children and one of his ex-wives have passed away. Following his death, his body went unclaimed. Authorities are still unsure of how Crisco and Anita came into contact, or if they were in any way previously connected before the day of the murder. They are asking anyone who may be able to provide such information to call the Huntington Beach Police tip line. Anita's body was returned to her family in Maine. They held a private service for her, with some of the investigators from California in attendance. Anita was buried in Waterville, Maine. While they will never see Anita's killer brought to justice, the remaining members of her family are relieved to have finally found answers and been given the opportunity to lay Anita to rest. It is a big weight lifted off. She is not missing anymore, said Anita's niece, Lori. She is close to us now. We have a sense of peace that comes with that. Michelle Missy Jones was born on May 13, 1962. She attended Park West Continuation School, where she helped found a yearbook club. After graduation, she found a job working as a police dispatcher in Claremont, California. She loved to dance and go roller skating, and was meticulous about keeping her hair and nails done. She was popular and regularly invited to parties. 18-year-old Missy was getting ready for a 4th of July party the last time her family saw her. She did not come home from the party, which was out of character for her, so her parents began calling all of her friends looking for her on the morning of July 5, 1980. That same morning, police received a phone call reporting that a woman's body had been found in a grapefruit grove near the intersection of Live Oak and Santa Ana Avenues in Fontana, California. Her head was partially covered in dirt, and she was naked. It was later determined that she had been sexually assaulted. By that afternoon, the woman had been identified as Missy Jones, and her family was notified. Several pieces of evidence were collected at the scene, and police followed up on several leads. Unfortunately, the case went cold. Missy's sister Melissa walked past the cemetery where Missy was buried every day of her senior year of high school on her way to school. She would wonder about the things Missy would have been doing with her life had she not been killed, and try to figure out who could have taken Missy from their family, and why they would want to do something so terrible to someone so loving and kind. Both of Missy's parents passed away never knowing who killed their daughter. In 2020, samples taken by police four decades earlier were processed for DNA. A profile from a single male individual was developed, but there was no match to it in the combined DNA index system. Authorities then began re-interviewing members of Missy's family. They identified a potential suspect, a former boyfriend of one of Missy's sisters. The man was now 66 years old and living in Las Vegas. Police surveilled the man and surreptitiously collected an item he discarded to test it for DNA. It was a match to the DNA found at the crime scene. On September 8, 2020, 40 years after Missy's murder, Leonard Nash was arrested for the crime in Nevada to be extradited back to California. On Saturday, September 19, 2020, Missy's family held a service at her graveside to honor her memory and celebrate the solving of her case. 
they released 40 balloons, one for each year they had been without her. In addition, the family also used the service to remember other families who are still waiting for the answers they have finally found. We're also doing this for everyone else who's had to go through what we've been through, said Missy's sister Melissa. There are so many people out there whose loved ones were killed or have gone missing, and they still have no idea what happened. Seventeen-year-old Mary London was a student at Sacramento High School. She was developmentally disabled, and therefore still in the 10th grade. At the beginning of 1981, she was living in a foster home. She never came home on January 14, 1981. The following morning, January 15, Mary's body was found along a rural stretch of San Juan Road in North Sacramento. She was wearing only white socks and one shoe. She had been sexually assaulted and then stabbed multiple times. Dozens of interviews were conducted and numerous leads followed, but Mary's killer remained unidentified. In 2016, Mary's case was reopened. Authorities made a public appeal to try to identify someone known only as Daryl, who was not considered a suspect in the case. He was instead a friend of Mary's, and police thought it was important for them to speak with him. DNA evidence was also available in the case, and while the technology needed to utilize it to solve the crime did not exist in 1981, it did in 2020. On April 22, 2020, Sacramento Police Chief Daniel Hahn and County District Attorney Anne Marie Schubert announced that genetic genealogy had been used to identify Mary London's murderer, a man named Vernon Parker. Parker had not previously been a suspect in the case, and he had not even come up during the course of the initial investigation. Unfortunately, Parker, who had been approximately the same age as Mary, could not be prosecuted for the crime because he was deceased. He had been murdered in downtown Sacramento just over a year after Mary's murder. You can't escape justice, Chief Han pointed out. You can't outrun the horrific things you have done to another human being in our community. One of the original detectives on the case was David Schwartz, a father of eight originally from Wisconsin. He never forgot about Mary's case, which was finally solved around the time he turned 90. He was personally satisfied that the case was closed and very happy for Mary's family to finally have answers. He made sure he was there to meet Mary's half-sister, Esther Schneider, and her daughter when the announcement of the identification of Mary's killer was made. He would have liked to have given her a hug on the occasion, but had to maintain a safe social distance. In 1981, Esther had only learned of her sister's death after seeing it on the news. In 2020, she was informed that the case was solved in person. She was grateful to everyone who worked on Mary's case over the years, and believes her sister can now finally be at peace. 